Hello and welcome to lecture number five in our ongoing series in physiological psychology. This will be the first part of uh, lecture number five on structures of the vertebrate nervous system. In this fir first part, we'll do an overall um, overview of structures of the vertebrate nervous system, talk about anatomical directions in the nervous system, a little bit about the spinal cord, and then spend some time on the autonomic nervous system. In part two, uh, we will then start to look at the major uh, subdivisions of the vertebrate brain. We'll start though with some overall structures of the vertebrate nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Everything else is the peripheral nervous system uh, in all vertebrates. So the peripheral nervous system connects the brain and the spinal cord to the rest of the body. There are several different subdivisions of the peripheral nervous system which include the somatic nervous system which consists of axons conveying messages from the sense organs to the central nervous system and from the central nervous system to the muscles. So the somatic nervous system is generally thought of as the part of the body that interacts with our environment. So sensory message come into the central nervous system and then we can direct our musculoskeletal system via the somatic nervous system as well. So this is how we interact with our environment. It's how we walk, talk, see, hear, feel, taste, touch. All of that is the somatic nervous system. Um, the autonomic nervous system controls our body's internal environment, so heart rate, intestines, other organs, it's regulating our body's internal state. Uh, so it's essentially involved in regulating hunger, thirst, um, etc., keeping our heartbeat, telling us to breathe, regulating salinity in our blood, and all sorts of um, automatic processes are all happening via the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the autonomic nervous system also has two subcomponents we'll talk about here in a little bit, the, per the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which are involved in our fight or flight responses, and so we'll talk more about that here in a moment. So the central nervous system then is the brain and the spinal cord. If it's not the brain or the spinal cord, it is the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system connects the brain and spinal cord to everything else. The somatic nervous system is our sensory systems and our motor systems, eyes, ears, taste, touch, etc., as well as all of our motor systems, so our ability to talk, walk, throw a ball, all of that is the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system then controls heartbeat, intestines, and all of our internal environment. So you can see here, central nervous system the brain and the spinal cord. Everything in blue is the somatic nervous system, and everything in red is the autonomic nervous system, which is all primarily in here. want to uh, introduce you to the uh, way in which we talk about the nervous system in vertebrates, in particular humans, because obviously this is a physiological psychology class. We're primarily talking about human brains, although we will certainly talk about other animals as well. Um, the first thing to talk about is uh, the ways in which we can slice up a brain. Uh, these were initially uh, discussed in terms of um, how we actually did slice up brains. Now we talk about these in terms of things like computed axial tomography or magnetic resonance imaging. So a coronal section is what we have up here in the upper left hand corner. It's essentially uh, what you can see here through this slice, it's going sort of vertically through the brain. Um, it's called the corona because it supposedly looks like a crown. Um, so that's this kind of uh, coronal frontal section. Anything towards the middle of the brain here is medial, anything towards the outside is lateral. We'll talk about that more here in a moment. Then this sagittal section uh, would actually be going down the full length of the uh, brain going sort of this direction if there was a third plane, oh sorry, here it is, uh, this third plane right here, this would be the sagittal section, you can see it up here. Uh, this frontal part of the brain is called the anterior portion, the back is called the posterior portion of the, um, of the brain if we're looking at it from this direction. And then a lateral section, or horizontal section, I'm sorry, uh, is one that goes this direction, horizontal to the ground. Um, and so you can see that sort of slice here, and then again we have medial and lateral, and then anterior and posterior. Uh, now, things start to get a little bit more difficult when we start to talk about the spinal cord. Anything towards our side is lateral, or towards the middle is medial. Anything towards 
Our chest is ventral, anything towards the back is dorsal. Now when we talk about the brain, anything that's towards the top is dorsal, and anything towards uh, the bottom is ventral or inferior, dorsal is superior. Now this is again where it starts to get slightly more confusing. Um, <laughs> when we are talking about human beings, the ventral side of our body is the chest side, the dorsal side is the back side, whereas the ventral side of the brain is the lower side and the dorsal side is the top side. Um, we talk about things being more cranial and more caudal in terms of their direction in the um, spinal cord, and then of course we have posterior or dorsal and anterior or ventral. Now this is the posterior side of the body, but this is the posterior side of the brain. This is the dorsal side of the brain, that is the bottom, and the, I'm sorry, the ventral side of the brain, and the dorsal side is the top. It starts to get a little confusing. Um, so if we start to look at how this all comes together, the superior or dorsal side of the brain is towards the top, the ventral side of the brain is towards the bottom, the ventral side of the side of the spinal cord is towards the chest, the dorsal side of the spinal cord is towards the back. The reason this gets confusing is this was all designed for creatures that walk on all fours. So if you think about a cat or a dog, the top side of their brain is in the same direction as the top side of their spine. And so these directions were actually originally designed for talking about animals, and then we adopted them for humans in a not particularly clear way. So the dorsal side of the brain is the top, the ventral side is the bottom. This has become important because we'll talk about the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. We also want to, of course, know anterior and posterior. This is also sometimes frontal um, and posterior. Um, so when we talk about, for example, so example, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we're talking about this part of the brain right here. So you know it's dorsal towards the top, frontal means it's towards the front, and lateral means it's towards the edge. Well, it becomes important when we're trying to navigate exactly where we're talking about in terms of the human brain. So if we look at these different um, planes again, just to kind of summarize how these different planes of um, slicing through the brain work, a coronal plane looks like this and goes through uh, vertically through the brain. A horizontal plane goes from anterior to posterior, looks like this. And then the sagittal plane um, goes down the midline, sort of from your nose to the back of your head. So these are all the different ways in which we can slice up the brain. Now this is a pretty good summary of how this, all of these terms work, and they are certainly ones you're going to want to spend some time thinking about. So the dorsal side is towards the back, away from the stomach, and the top of the brain, because again that's its position in four-legged animals. Ventral is towards the stomach and away from the dorsal backside, and it's also towards the bottom of the brain. Anterior is towards the front, Posterior is towards the, ren, the uh, rear end, sorry. Anything that's superior is above, anything that is inferior is below. Lateral is towards the side or away from the midline. Medial is towards the midline, away from the side. Things that are proximal are close, things that are distal are far. Something that is ipsilateral is on the same side of the body. Something that is contralateral is on the opposite side of the body. And then we have those planes uh, we've talked about already. Now, there are different terms for different parts of the nervous system that you're definitely going to want to know as well. Lamina are a row or layer of cell bodies separated from other cell bodies by a layer of axons and dendrites. So we'll talk about lam like laminar mil talk about some different laminar bodies. A column is a set of cells that are perpendicular to the surface of the cortex with similar prop properties. We'll talk about things like ocular dominance columns. We'll talk about the visual system. A tract is a set of axons within the central nervous system, which is also sometimes known as a projection. Axons extend from cell bodies in structure A to synapses onto B. We say these fibers project from A onto B, so the tract, so the optic nerve tract, for example. A nerve is a set of axons in the periphery, either from the central nervous system to a muscle or gland, or from a sensory organ to the central nervous system, such as the optic nerve or the auditory nerve, or the vestibulocochlear nerve. A nucleus is a cl cluster of neuron bodies within the central nervous system. Ganglions are clusters of neural cell bodies, usually outside the central nervous system. Uh, we'll talk about the ganglion cells in the visual system. A gyrus is a protuberance on the surface of the brain, and a sulcus is a fold or a groove that separates one gyrus from another. So, for example, we'll talk about the um, 
prefrontal gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. So, so the postcentral gyrus is the um, primary somatosensory cortex. The precentral gyrus is the primary motor cortex. Um, we'll talk about the uh, central fissure or sulcus. It goes down the middle of the brain, etc. So these are all terms that you will need to come to understand and know uh, as we start to move through them because I'll use them uh, very regularly. So those are it's a very quick introduction to some very important terms. Uh, I suggest you, um, so as you in my course, make sure you print out those slides and really spend some time understanding those items. Uh, those of you watching this on YouTube, um, pause and take a look at those if they're part of a course you're studying because they are an important part of understanding uh, neuroanatomy. So I want to move to talking about the spinal cord, which is the part of the central nervous system found within the spinal column. It communicates with the somatosensory system and muscles, except for those of the face and skull. And they're communicated via some cranial nerves. Uh, entering dorsal roots of the spinal cord carry sensory information, and the exiting ventral roots carry motor information. It starts to become important, particularly for people who might have a uh, spinal cord lesion uh, due to something like multiple sclerosis that has demyelinated the um, sheath. Sometimes they can have a dorsal lesion, but not a ventral lesion, so they can end up with sensory information that's being lost or ultrasuction and motor information, depending on which side of the spinal column the lesion might be on. It's also as important uh, if you're someone who has back trouble, these dorsal roots can uh, become pinched and you can end up with pain. Uh, in fact, you can end up with referred pain. So for example, um, I know people who have uh, on the very, very bottom uh, sort of last two um, bones in their spinal column are off and um, are pinching that dorsal root nerve. Uh, and as a result, it feels like they have pain in their legs because of that pinched nerve. Cell bodies of the sensory neurons are located in clusters of neurons outside the spinal cord, and these are called the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, and so that's an important term we'll talk more about when we start talking about the somatosensory system. The spinal cord consists of two types of matter. Gray matter is located in the center of the spinal cord and is densely packed with cell bodies and dendrites. White matter is composed of mostly a myelinated axon that carries information from the gray matter of the brain to other areas of the spinal cord. So remember those myelinated neurons travel, uh, pro, uh, information travels much more quickly along them uh, and uh, as a result they are usually involved in much faster processes than are gray matter. Each segment sends sensor information to the brain and receives motor commands. So each section of the spinal cord uh, both sends sensor information to the brain and receives motor commands uh, from uh, the or to the uh, motor system. So that's the spinal column and the spinal cord. Um, we start talking about um, the sensory motor systems. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about the different uh, parts of the spinal cord and how they interact with our motor systems and our sensory systems. But the last thing I want to talk about in this first part of the vertebrate nervous system is to talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems which are part of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system sends and receives messages to regulate the autonomic behaviors of the body. So heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, etc. Uh, this is divided into two different systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is involved in arousing our body's uh, resources in a fight or flight response. So in a high stress situation, the sympathetic nervous system will kick in and it will cause a number of things to happen all at once. Your, the bronchi and your lungs will uh, dilate so that you can process oxygen more quickly your heart rate will strengthen and increase, your stomach will shut down uh, so that you're no longer hungry, uh, blood will be taken from your internal organs towards your muscles, uh, your pupils will dilate, um, all of these things will happen very quickly in a fight or flight response. So if we take a closer look at this, you can see the sympathetic outflow which are uh, from ganglia in near the spinal cord. Uh, travel out to the lungs, the salivary glands, the heart, the vagus, um, the 
pupils, stomach, liver, kidneys, sweat glands, small and large intestines, bladder, or genitals, all of these things um, get influenced. So we take blood away from all of these things on the that are not involved in a fight or flight response and put them towards our musculature. Uh, there are certain drugs that are what we call sympath sympathomimetic. I right, couldn't get that out. Um, basically, they mimic a sympathetic nervous system response. Uh, the sort of granddaddy of these is um, amphetamines or methamphetamines. They initiate a sympathetic nervous system response, and people who abuse those drugs are in this kind of state where blood's being taken from their internal organs for long periods of time, so it can be particularly damaging. So this is a network of nerves that prepare the organs for rigorous activity, uh, the sympathetic nervous system that is increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiration. Again, it's composed of ganglia on the left and right of the spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system facilitates vegetative and non-emergency responses, so more calm, relaxed. So it decreases functions that are increased by the sympathetic nervous system. It's composed of long preganglia and axons extending from the spinal cord and short post postganglionic fibers that are attached to the organs themselves. And this is dominant during our relaxed state. So most of the time uh, when we're sitting around in a relatively relaxed environment, the, the parasympathetic nervous system is uh, primarily involved. Um, the sympathetic nervous system will start to get involved during high stress situations, uh, during life threatening situations. We'll talk more about that later in the semester when we talk about stress and uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, final note about the autonomic nervous system is the neurotransmitters primarily involved in the autonomic nervous system are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Postganglionic axons of the parasympathetic nervous system mostly release acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter, uh, whereas the sympathetic nervous system mostly uses norepinephrine. So when we have a boost in norepinephrine, we get an increase in sympathetic nervous system response which is why drugs like amphetamines and cocaine can initiate a sympathetic nervous system response. Um, whereas acetylcholine um, does not, is more involved with um, the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which keeps us in that more relaxed state. So that's a brief introduction to uh, the vertebrate nervous system. We're going to spend uh, the next part of our time in the next uh, part two of this lecture uh, on the various divisions of the uh, vertebrate brain.